Okay, so more on Newton's laws in two dimensions. And we're going to look at a special case today. Um, just like how, you know, projectile motion is a special case of um, motion in two dimensions. The inclined plane is a special case and a, and a very, very famous look at um, motion, or excuse me, Newton's laws in two dimensions. These types of problems are very common. Okay, many real life situations involve something slipping down a hill or a ramp or some sort of incline. Um, and it's really important, uh, it's a very important application, right? The key to solving these problems is to use a creative choice for our coordinate system so that it lines up with the acceleration of the sliding object and to understand that, hey, this is one case when the normal force is not the same as gravity. That's a very, very typical assumption in problem solving, especially when I look at my grade 11 course. Many students want to just say, oh yeah, the normal force is equal to mg. And that's because on a flat surface, when you have no other forces other than the normal and gravity acting in the y direction, the normal force is the same as gravity, just in the opposite direction. But we have to be careful, because in this case, the normal force is quite different, as you will see. So let's consider a standard inclined plane. Okay, Here, the normal force, we know, is always perpendicular to the surface. So the normal force acts in this direction. Gravity, on the other hand, still acts down the hill. And what the result of this is, is that the magnitude of gravity, this vector, is larger than the magnitude of the normal force, and this block slips down the hill. So instead of considering our normal coordinate system, which would be in the x and y direction, we're going to alter our coordinate system, and we're going to shift x and y in this direction. Okay, So we've got x is the dimension along the plane, and y is the dimension perpendicular to the plane, and, you know, positive x can be up the hill, positive x can be down the hill, it doesn't matter. As you'll see when we're solving some of these problems, we can put the positive x direction in the direction that it's going to accelerate, or we can put it opposite, it's really up to us. So, forward, moving on. The motion, or specifically the acceleration, of the block has to be in the direction of the plane, as we said before. So it's along the length of that hypotenuse. Right? So really we're going to shift our coordinate system and now we, have, we come to something else that's a little bit more tricky. We need to resolve our forces into different directions because gravity is no longer in the y direction anymore. It's because we've tilted our coordinate system, gravity is in a little bit of a, well, it's in both x and y in our new coordinate system. So that's the only trick with doing this, is that we need to resolve our coordinate system. And we're going to do that. We're going to do that right now. Let's look at how we're going to do it. We need this diagram, and we need some basic geometry, because we're going to use some similar triangles. We're going to use some, um, some Pythagoras. Because really what's happening is that, okay, so here's our x and our y right here. And, of course, nor the normal force is in the y direction. No problem. But gravity, well, gravity is in both x and y because it's acting downwards. But in this case, because we've tilted the way we're going to describe x and y, we need to resolve gravity. So here's what it is. Right? Here is how we resolve gravity with these two vectors in x, which is in the direction of the plane, and y, which is perpendicular to the plane. So these are the components of gravity, our new components of gravity. And we need to write it like this because, again, we want to do the sum of the forces in the x direction and we want to look at the sum of the forces in the y direction. So we need this vector to be resolved into these two components. So this is more... Um, this is more um, really just vector work than anything else. Let's make a note of three special angles here. 
this angle beta, this angle gamma at the top, and this angle alpha at the bottom. Because um, what we're going to do next is we're going to do a, a little proof that this angle right here, alpha, is equal to this angle right here, beta. Because if we can prove that these two angles are equal, then what's really nice is, is that this is usually given in the problem. And then when we resolve our two vectors, if we can say that these two are equal, then we can simply use the angle of the incline to resolve these two. Okay? So we'll also note that, hey, by you know parallel angles, this, this guy right here, this angle right here, is beta. Right? If this is a line straight down and this side of the, uh, of the ramp goes straight down, then this right here is, of course, beta as well. So let's take a look. Let's keep on going. It would be ideal if we could use that angle of incline to resolve the vectors. So we need to prove that alpha equals beta. Now, you know, in my course in high school physics, I wouldn't ask you to reproduce this. But we should never just say that they're equal. So let's say first that alpha plus gamma plus 90 degrees is equal to 180. And the reason that we know that is because the interior angles of a triangle sum up to 180. Okay, so that's equation number one. We also know then that alpha plus beta is, or excuse me, gamma plus beta is equal to 90 degrees. Right, because that third angle is 90 degrees, and alpha and beta are the other two angles in the triangle. So alpha, or sorry, gamma plus beta is equal to 90. So that's equation number two. All right, so let's rearrange this so that we get gamma here, 90 minus beta. And let's say, oh, all right, well, if I make a quick substitution, alpha plus 90 minus beta plus 90 equals 180, and look at what we get. We simply get alpha minus beta equals 0, and alpha equals beta. That was pretty painless. And now we're certain that, hey, that angle that represents the incline of the ramp can be used to resolve our vectors, which is great news, which is great news, because it's going to make things a lot simpler. So let's resolve them. Here's the force of gravity going down. Here's the force of gravity in the y direction. Here's the force of gravity in the x direction. And we can say that FGY, this component, using the cosine ratio, is mg cos theta. And FGX, this component right here, is equal to mg sine theta. This was using the sine ratio. And we've just resolved these into their two little components. So basically, theta is the angle of incline of the hill, right? So this angle right here, we called this beta before. Really, this now is the angle of incline of the hill. We just proved that this angle was the same as that angle of inclination. So this is really nice. This is very, very convenient. And we're going to take a look at an example. All right, so a student sits at the top of a frictionless, snow-covered hill. Find the student's acceleration if the angle of incline is 25 degrees. So here it is, a student, which is this little box right here, sits at the top of a hill. And these are the only two forces that are acting. we got the normal force, we got gravity, and the student's going to slip down the hill inclined at 25 degrees. Okay, so here is our free body diagram. I got normal in the upwards direction, and I've got my two components, my resolved components of gravity. I got my force of gravity in Y, and I've got my force of gravity in X. The acceleration moves this down the hill. So, F net equals MA. And in the x direction alone, I get that the force of gravity times sine theta, because that's what this component is equal to, is equal to ma. The force of gravity is simply mg. 
Um, again, this sine theta is because this is what the resolved component is, and that's equal to ma. So the m's cancel. I get the acceleration of this student down the hill is g sine theta. And when I make the substitutions, I get 4.1 meters per second squared down the incline. All right, so try this. This is one that you should try on your own. What's the value of the normal force in this case? Because it's going to be a little bit different. The normal force is going to be, of course, equal to the y component of gravity. If you're curious, it's mg cos theta. Try it, figure out what the value of the normal force is. All right, example number two. Um, a 20 kilogram crate slides down an inclined plane that now has friction. 0 0.3 is the coefficient of friction. The hill is at an angle of 30 degrees. What's the acceleration of the crate? All right, so here we go. Our free body diagram of the crate sliding down the hill. We got x, the positive x, in the direction that it's going to accelerate because it's going to zip down the hill. We've got, of course, the force of friction, which is acting to prevent slipping. So it is moving in the opposite direction to this component of gravity. And we've got our normal and our y component of gravity. All right, so what we need to do, first of all, is we need to say F net equals MA. The second step of almost all of these problems after we draw our free body diagram. And we're going to look in the I hat and the J hat direction. So we've got the normal force acting in the plus J hat direction. Okay, so Fn, J hat. Plus, we've got the x component of gravity in the i hat, so mg sine theta in the i hat direction. We've got the y component of gravity, mg cos theta, in the j hat direction. But remember, this one's directed down, so we have to give it a little negative. And we've got the force of friction that's acting in the negative i hat direction. So we got minus the force of friction but it's acting in the negative i hat direction, and that's equal to ma. So there should be a little i hat here, right here. So if we extract our j hat components, right, our j hat components, and we write them here, normal minus mg cos theta is equal to zero. Now stop and think about this. Why would the acceleration in the y direction be zero? And if you've thought about it, and you said that the answer was, well, because when it's sliding down the hill, it's not doing this. Like it's not jumping off the hill as it slides down the hill. Its motion, its acceleration in the y direction is zero. We can then say that, okay, that's going to give us a value for our normal force. Here, though, if we extract and pull out our x direction, or our i hat direction, we've got mg sine theta minus the force of friction is equal to ma. And this is because there is an acceleration in the x direction down the hill. So solving up here, we've got the normal force is equal to mg cos theta. And of course, we're going to use this expression when we sub in our force of friction. So here's the normal force when we've solved for everything, it's 170. And let's take this now and put this up here. Um, we know that, of course, normal is equal to mu k, sorry, friction is equal to mu k times normal. And so we begin by stating this. We know mu, it was given to us in the problem. So we can say that 20 times 9.8 times sine of 30 minus 0 0.3 times 170 is equal to 20 times the acceleration. And it's simply algebra from here. And we get acceleration equals 2.35 meters per second squared down the incline. Or 2.4 i-hat meters per second squared. So um, a lot of things to think about in this lesson specifically we will revisit this during class time. Um, and you should definitely be trying a couple of these questions eventually. 
um, in the homework that's been assigned. But for now, what's important is, you know, we have been able to take a rotated coordinate system and write in algebraic vector notation the um, Newton's second law for this situation. This is a huge step. Really what we do from here is find the normal force, plug it into friction, and then find the acceleration. And if you are comfortable with this, this will bode very well. Um, of course, practice is what will convince you that you're comfortable with this, and we'll be able to do that in class.